So, today for fun times and enjoyment, we're going to be looking at a bunch of articles about uh, the cut flower industry and how absolutely terrible it is. Uh, I found this uh, from laborrights.org. It's like a fact sheet. It's, it's literally for like uh, school children about the cut flower industry, but it's got like a lot of really great information. So, cool. Flower facts. U.S. consumers spend over 18 billion annually on fresh cut flowers. The United States imports over 80% of its flowers. Colombia is the largest exporter of U.S. Uh, of uh, to, exported to the U.S., followed by Ecuador, both of which export 70% of their flowers to the United States. Over 60% of flowers imported to the U.S. come from Colombia. There are 75,000 flower workers in Ecuador and over 100,000 in Colombia working to grow, harvest, package, and package flowers. Additionally, people indirectly depend on the flower industry for their employment, including those who transport flowers or produce, uh, or produce the inputs. 60% of Colombian and Ecuadorian flower workers are women. Sexual harassment of female workers proceeds unchecked, as 55% of Ecuadorian flower workers have been the victim of some form of sexual harassment. The aggressors are mostly never punished by the company or the courts. Due to heavy use of pesticides and fungicides, nearly two-thirds of Colombian flower workers suffer from one or more flo floriculture-related health problems, including headaches, nausea, impaired vision, conjunctivitis, rashes, asthma, congenital malformations, respiratory, and neurological problems. So it's just getting more fun by the minute. Uh, most flower workers are paid po uh, poverty-level wages, and Colombia workers own an average of $7 a day, a fraction of what U.S. consumers pay for, the, for one bouquet of flowers. Women are forced to take pregnancy tests as a condition of hire. If found to be pregnant, they are not hired. Women who are found to be pregnant after starting work at a flower farm are often fired. According to a 2000, uh, to a 2000 study of the International Labour Organization, an estimated that 20% of the 60,000 60, Ecuadorian flower workers were children or young adults. Many workers are employed through labor cooperatives or subcontractors. These workers are paid less and denied most basic rights, including the right to join a... It cuts off there, but I'm going to assume it says union. Yeah, 100%. So... Um, Oh yeah, during a regular week, a male flower worker wakes up at around 5 a.m. to get the bus. He arrives at the plantation, puts on his work clothes and must be in position by the time the bell rings at 6.15. He most likely is assigned work in a greenhouse, composting, fumigation or, or building new, new greenhouses. On a typical day, a woman flower worker wakes up at 3 a.m. in order to finish her housework, feed the children and prepare for school. She could be either go to work in the classification and packaging room in which flowers are sorted for quality, stem length, color... Or she may be weeding or harvesting in the greenhouse. Workers are, are frequently exposed to dangerous chemicals. Women are victims of various forms of sexual harassment. Heavy workloads result in repetitive stress injuries. And women report ruptures, varicose vein from standing long, standing long hours and kidney problems from restricted bathroom use. Oh, there was one... Um, Oh, here. Um, uh, from Paso International, .org, pa Paso International or Paso Internacional, um, about the, the injuries <laughs> suffered by the workers. Uh, in one case, a woman suffered a head injury while working at Colibri Flowers and was sent home. After three days with severe headache, she became paralyzed in half her body. The injury had not been documented at her worksite, but a general health practitioner determined that she had suffered a work-related injury. She was referred to, a, to the company's occupational health service, which recognized her occupational disability and ordered her a 170-day rest period, during which she received her wages. However, the um, uh, ARL, uh, Administrators of Labor Risk, then indicated that she could return to work, despite her continued paralysis, only 10 days before she had accrued the 180 days of disability necessary to qualify for long-term disability pay. With no other options to return to a job, it was promptly fired. She then filed a lawsuit and uh, uh, demanding she be hired in a position which she could, she would be able to perform. 
and the lost wages, but a ruling is, pen is still pending 18 months after the accident. Her condition has not improved and she has gone into debt to feed her family. And we have a short YouTube clip. God, it's also depressing. Okay. Can you hear it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Destined to the whole world. Oh. And especially you. Many of the Americans import more. The insatiable hunger for Colombian flowers has fostered an unparalleled industry. Practically the entire region around capital Bogota has been transformed into a huge flower farm. What? What is this? Like the the shards of glass for? Would somebody break into a flower company, or is it? Um, I, I just for animals. No, it's probably for people. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, oh, so stealing wages, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. At first glance, the environmental consequences. For like insects, but not for pesticides, so they can just spray as much as they want, just so they like getting that because like. At my supermarket, I'm seeing the like the cheap flowers and the fair trade flowers, and most people go for cheap. Like the the idea that like Europe wants just like is happy to pay more for for fair trade is just ridiculous. Yeah, no, yeah, no, that's patently false. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there there are some interesting themes mm -hmm. that are coming up. Yeah. In these articles, um, you know, obviously, there's the easy call to imperialism. Obviously, which you can point out. Yeah. Um, you know, these practices aren't aren't as common in mm -hmm. America because we export this type of behavior. Yeah. Um, in these low wages mm -hmm. uh, to to exploit what the global South um, for their labor mm -hmm. to make these products in yeah. a way that we can't get away with. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting theme that comes up, and Marx talks about it as well, is um, the the exploitation of the free labor of women. Yeah. Um, it mentions that women have to wake up two hours earlier mm -hmm. at these flower farms. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. But that's another level of mm -hmm. exploitation. Um, they actually. You know, it's just, yeah. They actually try to make sort of a, a, a virtue out of like out of this. Like they sort of advertise themselves as like you know the employment opportunity for you know single mothers. Yeah, no, and that's that was the spin on. Mm -hmm. That's the spin that's going to be applied to a lot of these. Yeah, is that the while some of the practices locally mm -hmm. might be backwards, yeah. it's actually an opportunity that's being provided mm -hmm. by this imperial exploitation. Yeah. Um, so that's the that's the same reason that they try and advertise, you know. Well, actually, there's a really high demand for these flowers if mm -hmm. it's done ethically. Yeah. Well, we know that there's no ethical consumption. We know that mm -hmm. there's no way to ethically produce yeah. billions of dollars worth of flowers mm -hmm. in global South nations and then export that to markets in America and Europe. Yeah. That's that's just not ever going to be a thing. Um, also because we, like a, would, oh, hmm. sorry. Uh, also because like a fair trade label is just gonna make more money for the company like th there's no way to like ensure that that money actually goes to the workers so they just like no, have more profit yeah we know that it won't yeah um, but they're trying to convince you that the profit motive mm -hmm. would would sort of enhance a company's need to treat their workers ethically mm -hmm. but you got to these employees actually have hats on. Yeah. As though that's some sort of, that's like our ethical standard here. Mm -hmm. They're wearing hats and gloves. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I don't think that's a reasonable standard. And I, I know from living in a very mm -hmm. consumer heavy culture mm -hmm. that there's no chance that you're going to put an ethical or an organic label on it and sell a higher volume. No. than just a cheaper option mm -hmm. elsewhere. Yeah. Like, that's just not the thing. But yeah. it's 
it's a spin that they're trying to do. There's definitely, even in the these seemingly critical articles in that video, especially, mm-hmm. um, as critical as they may seem, yeah. they are still trying to present this as though like the flower industry is crucial mm-hmm. when it's not. Yeah, it is in and of itself an exploitation and. Mm-hmm. Really, the only ethical way to do this would be for us to all grow our own flowers yeah. at home that grow natively in our environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently, that's just not what's done. Yeah. Shall we get into environmental impact? Ah, of course. <laughs> I almost, forgot to, I almost forgot that part of the video. Yep. Right. <laughs> um, there were, uh, flowers need water and lots of it to grow, which is true. Uh, the flower industry requires an abundance of natural resources such as labor, soil, water, and sunlight. While some flower industry needs are sustainable, such as sunlight, the flower industry requires unsustainable amounts of water. Water depletion is a grave consequence of the flower industry. This is due to a global phenomenon that is referred to as the virtual water trade. A flower is 90% water, so when a flower is exported, water is exported as well, effectively draining local water supplies. One flower grow- growing company actually had to cut back production over a- due to over-exploitation of resources. Their flowers had consumed all the water in the subsoil. Uh, reductions in the water table are a serious threat to, nearly, uh, to nearby residents and wildlife. Flower farms support uh, surrounding Lake Na- Naivasha in Kenya have caused the lake to recede 10 feet below the healthy level. Prior to the increase in the number of flower farms, the lake has no- was known for its pristine waters, over 300 bird species, papyrus plants and water lilies. Since the industry has grown around the lake, the plant life has disappeared, eaten by crayfish or trampled by animals as they seek a re- the receding water. The decrease in water level has caused the, the hippo- hippopotamus population to, dec- to decline by 20%. Uh, florica- floriculture is water and soil intensive. In Colombia alone, the flower industry covers an area over 16,000 acres. But another natural resource is essential for the flower industry, oil. Fuel is, fuel is, used to, is needed to power planes to transport flowers from places such as Colombia and Ecuador to Miami, Florida. Every round trip between Bogota, the capital of Colombia, and Miami admits 1.48 tons of carbon dioxide. In Miami, the flowers are temp- temporarily stored in refrigerated warehouses, which require huge amounts of energy to keep cool. From Miami, the flowers are transported by truck or refrigerated truck, which pump out even more greenhouse gases into the air. The flower industry generate, generates solid waste such, such as rejected flowers, plant stalks, pesticides and fungicides containers that require safe disposal. Until recently... Many Colombian farmers feed their, fed their cattle rejected, rejected carnation stalks. These stalks, ha- have, having been sprayed with numerous chemicals, contaminated the cow's milk. Farmers then sold the contaminated milk to neighboring towns and, and in Bogota, while unknowing people had ingested it. Although, although the practice is illegal now, it still continues in some areas. According to the Victorian International Development Education Association, a study showed that Ecuadorians used scraps from abandoned greenhouses for firewood, creating toxic fumes inside their homes. The study also showed that, showed that they used dogs and rejected flowers for compost. It's just like, from beginning to end, it's just awful. And it's so, yeah, and, so and, pointless. <laughs> like, you know, like cut flowers is definitely something we could live without, like, very easily. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know, consumer culture, we have to have. Yeah. It. And the the point that you made earlier about it being easier to get uh, pesticides mm-hmm. through customs than insects. Yeah. Is, you know, when we talk about the exploitation of these global South countries, this, mm-hmm. is, this is the sort of thing that we're actually discussing. Um, yeah. A lot of people will brush over these subjects like, oh, there's... Mm-hmm exploitation or imperialism and you know that's sort of the end of their critique but yeah. like the actual impact mm-hmm. that just the demand for cut flowers which in the grand scheme of things that we consume yeah. in these countries is actually fairly low on mm-hmm. the list maybe Colombia specifically yeah um has a pretty high demand but 
if you think about all the things that we get from Venezuela, from from Brazil, mm-hmm. from the Africas, like it's yeah. just it's incredible. Yeah. The amount of damage that we cause yeah. to the people and to the environment for things that are just either unnecessary or that are possible to be grown more locally, Mm -hmm. just less cost-effective. Yeah. There's a video from a flower industry in Kenya. Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, God, sound, sorry. There we are. And then also, like, the more videos about the cut flower industry I look at, it's always like, no. oh, f- <laughs> ah, God. It's almost like... Professionalism <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> 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 but, like, in all these clips, it's like always like a white person sort of lecturing about how horrible people are being treated, and it's just... It's, mm-hmm. The optics are not great. <laughs> Yeah, no. Sir. Yeah, there we are. From that, we expect to get about 3,000 stems a day. Wow. Over one and a half billion pounds of flowers are sold in the UK each year, and millions will be bought from other stems. Many of them will be imported from farms like this. And so these will go where, these flowers? To the retailers in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. And is this a particular Mother's Day colour? Absolutely. The, pink? The, 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 what, there's so many shades of pink, and, and that is our main Mother's Day colour. Flying out of Nairobi, I headed out over the Rift Valley. Our destination was Lake Naivasha, the heart of... Oh my God, look, look. <laughs> That's all, yeah. f- all flowers. Yeah, yeah, factory farms. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> industry. I was here in 2003, highlighting campaigners' worries about the environmental impact of the trade on the lake. We'd made public serious concerns about working conditions too. The flower farm I'm working with, I think we experience a lot of problems there. The argument has been that food and flowers for export are Africa's best chance of growing economically. Horticulture now accounts for 14% of Kenya's GDP. But recently, authorities here have questioned how much of that money actually stays in Kenya. They suspect the profits have been shifted elsewhere. Of course it's they not have. About yeah. Legal and legal anymore. It's about what is ethical and what is unethical. I had come back to look into this new complaint and to see if anything had changed. Who are the winners and losers from the flower business today? This is Flamingo Farm. I was being shown round by the farm manager, Craig. They are beautiful. Yeah, these flowers. Got your tree fern here, and the Dipsophila, the loose roses, um, and sandy carnation. He told us about the crisis in 2009, when the lake shrank in a severe drought, putting the whole business under threat. We have to be very, very vigilant on, on our water usage. We, we, we have several communities here. We have the nomadic uh, Maasai, who rely on the lake for their drinking water for their cattle. We also have a large um, amount of, of game. We also have um, the population around the lake as well. We, we need to ensure that there is... Listing the people after the game is just so telling. ...water for, for, for everyone. I wouldn't say there's necessarily a conflict, but what we need to do is, is bring ourselves all together to, to share this resource. Some of the big companies, like Flamingo, have invested heavily and managed to cut their water use dramatically. Flamingo has also worked hard with other organisations around the lake to agree how to share this vital resource. I wondered whether the groups Craig mentioned saw the same progress too. Uh, you are one of the leaders of the pastoralists. Yes, yeah, one I'm of the one of them uh, uh, around here in Russia. And tell me, tell me a little bit about the lake and how you use it. As a pastoralist for the so the 13 years I've been here, grazing as a young boy, and coming here as a leader of the pastoralist, I've seen this lake changing, which has really reduced uh, our grazing land since uh, the days of our grand- grandfathers. Do you think there's a good balance between the different needs of business for water and 
the other people like pastoralists, fishermen at the moment? Uh, I would say actually there is no much balance because we realize that as pastoralists with our animals and uh, you know 95% of our income comes from these animals. We see that uh, because of the increase in development around this lake, uh, access routes to the lake is becoming reduced, it's becoming very little uh, compared to the number of livestock uh, we have. So the issue of uh, conflict, the issue of uh, the issue of the soil erosion is becomes a, a problem in this case. So uh, we find that, the, for example, the flower farms uh, having more access to water than us. The flower farms create lots of jobs for people, don't they? They're a really important part of the economy, though. Yes. So, so are you saying they shouldn't be here? Uh, uh, I would not really say they should not be here because uh, brothers and fellow Kenyans are working on it, also depending on it in terms of their income and to sustain their families. But we also see, as pastoralists, we are not benefiting from it because, uh, you see, most of us are, are not educated. Most of these platforms are trying to look for people who, are, who at least have uh, an education. Back at the farm, production was still in full swing. These flowers were destined for M&S in the UK. At peak periods like Mother's Day, a million stems can be dispatched each day. Overseeing production was Karen. She'd worked her way up through the ranks. A lot of effort's gone into training and promoting local staff since 2003. Tell me a little bit about the sort of people who are working here. Are they people who've come into the area? Are they people oh, who okay. lived here already? Or? Quite a number of people, because Kenya is obviously quite a big country, actually migrate from yeah. various places. Western yeah. Kenya is probably like four or five hours away from here. You have people who are residents or who have families there who come and look for employment here. So it's a very mixed cultured industry because there's a lot of employment. All the flamingo flowers are now produced to fair trade standards. M&S has worked with the company to respond to most of the criticisms. Workers here told us that conditions really have improved. <coughs> Pesticide use has been cut drastically. The consumer outcry in 2003 seemed to have driven big changes. I wondered if the same was true across the industry. I arranged to meet up with a worker from a different company. She didn't want us to identify where she worked. Do you think it's good that the flower farms are here or not? It's good because it has helped many of our, our ladies. Most of us, we are single and we are left with the children. So I think it has helped us as women. Although their payment is not good to us. Yeah. How, how much money are you usually paid each month? Me, I'm paid uh, 65. 6,500? 6,500. And is that enough? It is not enough. That I, I, I told you that uh, that is not enough money for me. So I go underfeeding. So I also underfeed my children. What do you hope? Your children will do. But I, I don't wish my children to, to work in a flower farm. I want them to become engineers. I need lawyers there. I also need doctors. Yeah. Many workers we met described how hard it was to live on the wages. They're above the legal minimum, but still a struggle to survive on, especially as AIDS and unemployment among men has left many women as the breadwinners. The sector is thought to employ between 60 and 90,000 directly and around half a million indirectly. Add in their families and it supports over 2 million people in Kenya. But what's the effect of the influx of migrant workers on the local town and its infrastructure? Can you tell me what the impact of the horticulture industry has been on the area here in Mombasa? I guess way back in 1980, Naivasha was having a population of say around 6,000 people. Uh, the population now is, I guess, 240,000. So these people need houses, they need schools, they need hospitals, and uh, all those other services. Recognizing how desperate the need is, the industry agreed last year to begin paying a new local tax. Do you feel the industry contributes enough? Let me say they contribute uh, quite well for national development, for national growth. But for Naivasha municipalities, 
they give us nowadays they give us a bit of money to help uh, subsidize what we collect in town so that we can offer some services but i would say it's not enough I caught up with the flowers as they were being loaded onto planes for their journey to Europe and UK supermarkets. Horticultural exports bring in around $500 million to the economy. They're one of Kenya's biggest sources of revenue. But how much they contribute to Kenya's long-term growth depends on how much of the money they generate stays in Kenya. The Kenya Revenue Authority recently said it was investigating the whole flower sector, including the three largest multinationals. It suspects they're rooting their profits elsewhere and not paying a fair share in Kenya. We wanted to speak to the head of the revenue about its investigation, but he wasn't available. It's a sensitive subject. Some of the political elite have large investments in horticulture. We were able, however, to take our figures to Jack Ranguma. He used to be Kenya's head of domestic tax, and he'd started his own investigation into the flower industry in 2004. All these appear to indicate that the prices we receive back for the goods for the flowers we export is much, much less than what they are sold at the international market. Jack explained to me what he suspected was happening with multinationals. He believes they shift costs and profits around between their subsidiary companies in different countries, in some case offshore, so that there's less to tax in Kenya. I think as a country we are losing money through this process and it is necessary that we dig deep into it to know why the flowers sector is not making as much money as they should. Our investigation was raising some serious questions. Examination of Flamingo's corporate structure does not suggest the use of offshore subsidiaries, but other flower companies do have tax haven structures. I arranged to meet with Jane and Gige from the Kenya Flower Council, which represents many of the flower growers in Kenya. I started by asking how profitable the industry is. I believe that what one needs to understand is that, uh, yes, the industry is perceived to be very, very big, but it is highly capitalized, but the profit margins are very limited. Today, very few of those firms will make profits be beyond 5%. Jack had told us he found that hard to believe when so many companies were keen to invest in the sector. Atia Waris is a tax expert from the University of Nairobi, and I asked her if she thought that the sector was unprofitable. No single company, as an executive, strategic, profit-making institution, ever walks into a country, spends millions of shillings or dollars or pounds or euros putting up a business, and then turns around and says, we're not making a profit, but it's okay, we're going to stay. I really don't believe that it is humanly possible for a company that survives purely on its ability to make a profit is going to turn around and tell you that we have a company in this country for the past 10 years or 20 years, and you know we're just a benevolent association. We're just here to give employment and development, and we're really not making a profit. That is, that is a fairy tale. The Kenyan tax authorities have said they're going to investigate the sector and that they're looking at all the biggest three flower producers uh, because the industry isn't paying enough tax, that they're using various mechanisms to take more of the money offshore than they leave in Kenya. We are inundated with taxes, uh, left, right, and centre. Um, some we can justify, some we cannot. Jane said the industry welcomed the investigation. But until the government had looked at the figures, it was just speculation to say they weren't paying enough tax. So you want more tax breaks? If it is important enough to the country, the government does need to provide some sort of support like happens in other countries like Ethiopia. This is the dilemma facing countries like Kenya. They need tax for services and development. But with so many countries desperate to attract investment, there are always governments who are prepared to offer even bigger tax breaks and they end up in a race to the bottom. The economic benefit from the resources used in Africa, the water, the land, the people, ends up being transferred to shareholders in more developed countries. What would you say to people who buy flowers and vegetables from here in Europe? I would say, other than just buying that flower, they should consider how is the community benefiting. Then that will really help us.
come on, not again. <laughs> but it's so strange, like the talking points of like the the person uh, representing the companies sound so, like, oh no no, we, we we don't make any money and all the taxes are too high. It sounds like exactly like like this, what what they say everywhere else. Yeah, I mean that's, that's <laughs> at least the, enough, yep, <laughs> you know. Profitable. At least the talking points are equally distributed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty brutal. Mm. I mean, and when you see expansive farms like that, yeah. and that was really that those couple of shots from the air are really mm -hmm. the best glimpse that we've had in both of these, in any of these videos or articles, yeah. as to the scale of these operations. Mm -hmm. One, there's no way that those are built and they're not profitable Yeah. because, you know, we've grown stuff in our backyard and you can make a profit off that. Mm -hmm. Like imagine what you could do with yeah. your strip farming 500 acres mm -hmm. or whatever that was. Like, and number two, like that's, we're talking about one farm. Yeah. One of the farms was, was that monstrosity. Mm -hmm. So how much of the land and how many of the people are being exploited by this operation, it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And I mean, the idea that they like hire these huge airplanes for a commodity that makes no profit is just like, like <laughs> that makes yeah, no sense. That that's yeah. And we know that there's yeah. not really an investigation. No. And no one's really looking into it. Yeah. We, I mean, that's, that's how business works. Yeah. Um, Pretty straightforward. Yeah. But I also found this from uh, the Review of African Political Economy. I don't know who they are, but they um, wrote an article about the Kenyan cut flower industry, and I found this part really interesting. Um, what is interesting is that according to literature, Kenya is the only country in the world that, ha that has small holders growing, uh, growing cut flowers for export. They typically grow what is known as filler flowers, which are the colorful for the colorful varieties such as Arabicum, Eryngium, Alstromeria, Agapanthus, Graspedia, and um, Graspedia, among others. They make up a, a bouquet of greenhouse varieties such as roses and chrysanthemums. They are grown in the open in areas between a quarter acre and five acres of farmland. The farmers are scattered in the central highlands and drift valley areas and are few, no more than 10,000 in total. It is difficult to get exact numbers because there's no central database uh, updating figures. Uh, the last estimate of their contribution in 2008 by N.M. Motoka and Alice Muriti placed it between 5 and 13% of the value of cut flower exports. The last, the last comprehensive smallholder survey was done in 2010 by Fintrack and estimated the contribution between 7 to 10 million. The, the, sorry, the earliest instance of involvement of smallholders in Kenya cut flower industry goes back to 1970 when the government was trying to indigenize the industry largely seen as being dominated by foreigners. Uh, today, smallholders, smallholders grow cut flowers as a diversification strategy from high-value crops such as tea, green beans, peas and, to and potatoes. And so these smallholders are experienced farmers. In interviews for my research into the export floric culture in Kenya, they often describe cut flowers as gold for them, argued that they were more, more, financially, more financially secure and therefore food secure after venturing into the flower production. Of the approximately 10,000 smallholder cut flower farmers in Kenya, the vast majority operate at, as outgrowers for export firms such as Wilmore Agro Limited. These, these are networks of unorganized smallhold farmers who supply fillers for export companies, which are responsible for, the, for the coordination of supply logistics and marketing at the Dutch, Dutch flower auction. Outgrower schemes are the only form of organization for smallholders in this, in this subsector, sector, given that there is currently no flower farmers cooperative. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting. Um. I mean, it's it's like a really tiny operation, like ten thousand people. Yeah, and and additionally, you know, like I said, it's mostly like a rotation crop. Mm -hmm. So you, you're thinking more like companion growing yeah. sort of scale here, which is, you know, I would imagine 
if there's a flower industry mm -hmm. and there are also farmers yeah. and those farmers are trying to convert as much of their uh, production mm -hmm. into those flowers that yeah. are being exported as possible, which is how Colombia wound up in the situation that it, it is in. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously, as soon as the industry starts up, yeah. it won't have closed all of the edible production farms yeah. immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, that will have taken time, and this is that process. Yeah. Um, Large-scale corporations would be trying to grow roses and mm -hmm. whatnot to make a lot of money quickly. Yeah. And then the gaps in the market, which are, these are essentially wildflowers that, mm -hmm. again, if you were growing your flowers in your backyard, you'd be picking your wildflowers locally mm -hmm. for your bouquet as well. Um yeah, but these are those being produced for export. Yeah. It doesn't it seems like it's part of that market environment. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would describe it as uh growers or uh proletarians who own their own uh, yeah. means of production though. What was it? Um What was it when she said the thing about Lenin? What about oh yeah. Um, it is often easier for smallholders to set out as outgrowers working for an export company, which navigates the complexities of temperature-sensitive supply logistics, export handling, and the politics of market access. In some cases, these export firms provide farmers with inputs and crop-specific training, as well as quality checks. However, Maurice Bolo wrote in 2010, export firms' relationship with smallholders often limit the farmer's ability to move beyond production into, say, value addition or even trade, where there might be in direct competition with the export firms. The situation renders them into what Lenin once described as property proletarians, workers cultivating company crops on private allotments. So basically they grow the flowers, but they don't have, like they can't themselves fly them out to Europe, mm -hmm. obviously. So they, you know, are dependent on the exporter. You look super tired. Should we like end it here? No, I'm frustrated. Oh, I'm frustrated. sorry. <laughs> Suffice to say, Lenin is not one of my favorite theorists. Mm. Um, the concept of property proletarians is completely backwards to Marxist theory. <laughs> um, what this is is corporate farming. These aren't property proletarians they're mm. share croppers they don't own their land any more than they own the time that they have to spend making a product for a company mm. the company is not providing them with a service of exporting their product they're no. providing a product to a company they're trading their labor mm. for a wage and that wage yeah. pays for the land that they execute their labor on it's it's not an advanced position of a proletarian it's a it's a worsened position mm -hmm. for a proletarian. It's it's now your home being indebted more directly to this company. Yeah. Because everything that you do must be profitable to mm -hmm. this company. Yeah. In order for it to even reach market in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you're actually a step worse off than the serf. Yeah. Who who would live on someone else's land but bring their own product market mm -hmm. um, also like yeah, they're spending yeah they're also spending like time and effort and land on something that you know they're completely dependent on someone else making the price for it like they're not setting the price for their flowers it's the it's the company it's the exporter it's and they like you know the exporter can just decide that you know the flowers aren't good enough the quality isn't there or you know maybe this year yellow ye nobody wants yellow flowers so we're not going to buy those from you so you know there's mm -hmm. you know half your land you or like how many acres you spend growing flowers that you could have grown you know food on mm -hmm. yeah this is to call them property there's a little bit Lenin had this obsession with being able to label label people 
as either proletarian mm -hmm. or petty bourgeois. And he used this label of property proletarian mm -hmm. almost interchangeably yeah. with petty bourgeois. He also called the clergy property proletarian. Okay. Um, yeah. He called the clergy property <coughs> proletarian because they are members of the working class, but they exist separately mm -hmm. from the same systems of capitalist exploitation. Uh, that was early on. Uh -huh. And then after he got into power and started reaching uh, economic strife with his new regime, which wasn't stable because of the wars, mm -hmm. um, he then changed that label to the clergy or petty bourgeois mm -hmm. so that he could justify sending his uh, goon squads to churches to rob uh -huh. them of their valuables. Um, Strategy. Yeah, because they're just stri stripping the property from the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I think, I don't know exactly how the article is trying to use yeah. the quote, but it's very sketchy, quoting Lenin. As far as I've seen, it, it's never brought up again, so that, that was the one point they made about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Still, still makes one wonder <laughs> what theory is actually behind mm. the, uh, the article, like what when I see a quote that's mm -hmm. that bad being used to try and make a positive light on something that's also simultaneously so negative, mm -hmm. it makes me wonder what the person who wrote it is thinking about. Like, what, what is their leftist perspective that makes them consider this incredibly exploitative? Um, because these... A contractor mm -hmm. at least has a workplace that they go to yeah. and they clock in and they produce and they clock up mm -hmm. and they get paid their wage for that time. And they can so plan the on their wage. And they can plan on their wage. This is, you know, you're, you're making something and then hoping that the company will buy it mm -hmm. to take it to market yeah. to make a profit off of. Like, you, oof, it's, oof, that's not something that I would be celebrating. Mm. I mean, it's a massive gamble that you're working on for a year. You know, what's the, what's the title of this, this publication? The, uh, the Review of African Political Economy. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not a fan. Since 1974, the, uh, the Review of African Political Economy has provided radical analysis of trends, issues, and social processes in Africa, adopting a broadly materialist interpretation of change. Established as a group of scholars and activists in the UK and Africa, the journal is committed to understanding projects of radical transformation. From state-led attempts to political transformation in Tanzania to, to the later wave of independence in Mozambique and Angola, ROAPEs thought to uh, analyze the contradictions, potentials, and emerging class dynamic in these countries. Later in the 1980s, the journal focused on understanding the development of protest movements and the nature of the class struggle in the context of structural adjustment and was, uh, was tearing up the fragile, that was tearing up the fragile edifice of national states. As the continent has evolved in the 1990s and 2000s, we have continued to focus on patterns and processes of accumulation, local and national, while examining class, gender, and race as forms of exploitation, domination, and subordination. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. There, there could be a thousand of these types of reviews or... Yeah publishers or journals or whatever you want to call them that that put things out I yeah I'm not sure mm. and I skipped over a bunch maybe I, I like missed something important in there it's possible huh. I don't know it's just something that I notice when I see people I, I have this thing about mm -hmm. when I read Articles, especially that are written with like these very <laughs> open leftist mm -hmm. slants, I like to examine very closely the types of rhetoric that they're using mm -hmm. 
the types of terminology, um, whether they use a descriptive language or an analytical language mm -hmm. to, to provide evidence for their arguments. Um, and one of the very big red flags for me is when I see people quoting Lenin. Um, that's, that's a very dangerous thing to do because Lenin himself was so corrupting the mm -hmm. leftist ideal. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's my opinion and the opinion of a lot of scholars that Lenin wasn't even attempting to do like a genuine socialist or Marxist transition, but he used that rhetoric mm -hmm. in order to get control of an organization. You know, it was pure, just political rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's pretty easy usually to see through its application. Um, sort of like in this case, so. Yeah, I think, I think mostly when you, when you think of a leftist critique of like mm -hmm. cut flower farming, you would be thinking about, you know, more local solutions, I think is sort of the core to any commune is mm -hmm. like approach is yeah. You know, existing within a self-sufficient commune. Mm -hmm. I don't know um, the idea of like we're we are property. We're better now. We <laughs> we don't work for the company. We work for ourselves, but are completely relying on the company in every way for everything that we do. Ever <laughs> like that's not that's not progress. That's rhetoric. <laughs> a Leninist approach to international capitalism. <laughs> Yeah, that's literally a Leninist approach to international capitalism. Yep. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> uh, the, what was it? Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, this is from the Smithsonian. They, they, by the way, they have the actual name of the guy who started the Colombian flower industry at the top. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to look it up in a second, but first I wanted to, to read this. Uh, sure. The industrial machine has been assembled at some cost. As the flowers business grow, researchers for, researchers for labor and environmental organizations documented the sorts of problems that typify developing economies. From the beginning, the majority of tens of thousands of job seekers who migrated from the savannah were, were women and many of them were single mothers. Most workers made the minimum wage, which is now about $250 a month. Many of them reported sexual harassment by, harassment by male bosses, long working hours without breaks, and repetitive stress injuries with no employer-provided treatment or time off. As recently as 1994, a Colombian sociologist found children as young as nine working in greenhouses on Saturdays, and children 11 and up working 46-hour weeks in almost all areas of the farms. Uh, a 1981 survey of almost 9,000 flower workers as by scientists from Colombia, France and Britain found that the work had exposed people to as many as 127 different chemicals, mostly fungicides and pesticides. Uh, one incentive to use pesticides, the U.S. Department of Agriculture checks imported flowers for insects, but not for chemical residues. A 1990 study of Columbia National Institute of Health suggested that pregnant, pregnant Colombian flower workers exposed to pesticides might have higher rates of miscarriages, premature birth, and babies with congenital defects. The, uh, Colombia's flower industry has been, has been profligate in its use of, vi of, uh, of a vital natural resource, fresh water. Producing a single rose bloom requires as much as three gallons of water. According to a study of the Kenyan flower industry by scientists at the University of Twente in, in the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands, full stop, sorry. <laughs> the Bogota uh, area receives 33 inches of rainfall annually, but after flower farms and other users, uh, other users drilled more than 5,000 wells on the savannah, groundwater levels plunged. One engineering study reported that springs, streams, and wetlands are disappearing. As Bogota continues to expand, the city and flower industry will be competing for the same dwindling supply. Yeah. I mean, it's got everything. It's got sexual harassment, it's got... Child labor, it's, oh, God, it's just awful. 
Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How the Colombian flower industry got started. In 1967, Dan, uh, David Cheever, a graduate student in horticulture at Colorado State University, wrote a paper entitled Bogota, Colombia as a cut flower exporter, exporter for world markets. The paper suggested that the savannah near Colombia's capital was the ideal place to, to grow flowers to sell in the, to the United States. Um, uh, after, <laughs> and, uh, uh, after graduating, Chiva put his theories into practice. He and three partners invested 25,000 apiece to start a business in Colombia called Flora America, which, which applied assembly land practices and modern shipping techniques at greenhouses close to Bogota's El Dorado International Airport. The company started with carnations. We did our first planting in October 1969 for Mother's Day 1970, and we hit, the, we hit it right on the money, said Cheever, 72, who is retired and lives in Medellin, Colombia, and New Hampshire. Yeah. This, just like one guy <laughs> writes a paper one at guy. university. Yeah, one guy. <laughs> Jesus. He's probably heralded somewhere. He does sure. like head talks now. Oh, God, yeah. Like <laughs> Here's how you start business and it's all great guys <laughs> we can all make millions <laughs> exploiting the global south terribly <laughs> destroying the environment and draining water from a literal rainforest mm -hmm. like come on <laughs> come on you're, you're drying up bogota are you kidding me mm -hmm. bogota <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to, I don't have to tell you, like the article said, we get 33 inches of rain a year. Yeah. That's nuts. Yep. Bring but, you know. Bogota? <laughs> uh, Come on. You know, pleasant climate with temp with little temperature variation and consistent lights about 12, hour 12 hours per day year round, ideal for a crop that must, uh, that must always be available. So, you know. Marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we, we stimulate those conditions <laughs> indoors. Call us hydroponics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so wild that all that started with one guy. Yeah, one guy. Yeah. That's, you know, most things start with one guy. Yeah. White dude, yep. But it's so rare. Yeah. It's so rare to know his name, to know their names. The one guy that started the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> Probably. Still lives. Still lives in Colombia, though. Yep. Of I course. Give him that. He can well, survey I all can. that he has achieved. <laughs> yeah. Great. Mm hmm. Yeah. No. The cut flower industry. That's. Like I, I've been saying this whole mm -hmm. time, I much prefer gardening edibles because they look good and they're useful. Yeah. And because flowers in general, all mm -hmm. of the aesthetic plants, flowers, hostas, all of them, most of the bushes, like, they're just so bad on principle. <laughs> they're, you know, they're very, they're very pretty mm -hmm. and it's, it's almost sustainable if you do it at at home alone mm -hmm. but man it's almost to me it's like it's like golf courses and like yeah. those manicured lawns they're just it's a waste of space mm -hmm. and a waste of good growing soil to even have these yeah and to think about the cost that the industry has mm -hmm. on people like it's just brutal yeah Like, I can't get away from the fact, like, if it was food, at least there'd be some rationale where you could, like, sort of, like, you could at least make an argument to defend it. But for flowers, it's just, like, mm -hmm. child labor, like, straight up child labor. Yeah, child labor for, for roses. For something nobody needs. Like, there's no, like, yep. you know. There's no use for most of these. Yeah. There. They're useless. Mm hmm Yep. Yep. <laughs> I'll labor for useless flowers. <laughs> um, <laughs> and again, like, I, you know, if you're growing, 
your flowers in your garden. You know, you can grow what you like in mm-hmm. your garden. Um, but like, don't force children to do it for you. To, uh, you, you know, <laughs> use your own children uh, to use it to do it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's some children that you have to look at every day. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make them work 46 hours. That's yeah. Crazy. 46 hours. I'm not gardening 46 no. hours. No. Like, I, like I, I don't think I could do it. Like, even if I really, really tried, I don't think I could garden for 46 hours. <laughs> Maybe that's a challenge for the summer. The Columbia, <laughs> the Colombian challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Oh, and actually, like and, uh, before, like Valentine's Day and Mother's Day, they, they they sometimes work eighty hours a week. So, forty six hours is like a light load. Crazy. Yeah. So, on this entirely depressing note, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Have a lovely e- e- evening. It's evening where yeah, you are. Yes. Morning. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> have a lovely time and I will see you soon. <laughs> Bye.